the Shiki Science Show clips. Um, and so I guess, like, yeah, speaking more about um, memory and just like intelligence in general, um, and how like intelligence can be seen, I guess, like at different levels, um, and how you don't have to have like a brain and a you know multicellularity to have intelligence, because you had an interesting study that came out. Uh, a couple of years ago maybe uh where you have something called cenobots where you just took some some cells and you uh I mean you're probably going to explain it better than I can but you were able to sort of get it to do different behaviors and show forms of intelligence and I was just wondering if you could explain a bit better than I have about that (laughs) yeah so so there's two there's two interesting pieces there um one one piece has to do with intelligence, and then and then I'll, more broadly, and then I'll I'll talk about the xenobots. Um, I wanna I wanna start with the intelligence part because I I haven't specifically made any claims about um, what kind of intelligence the xenobots have. That's still very much under investigation. But I wanna I wanna say something about intelligence first. Um, <clears throat> to me, here's a here's a proposed, and there are many, but here's a proposed definition of intelligence. And I, I in, intelligence. I think is uh, I, I like William James's intelligence definition of intelligence, which is the ability to get to the same goal by different means. So I think that's very powerful. And well, I would put two, two twists on that. I would say one is yes, and that goal can be stated in many different problem spaces. So not just physical space, but it might be morphous space. It might be transcriptional space. It might be um, you know linguistic space in the case of uh, of, of advanced uh, you know, humans and whatnot. Uh, transcri- um, um, transcriptional space, physiological space. And your degree of intelligence is the competency with which you pursue the goals that you pursue. And your sort of cognitive sophistication is the size of the goals you're able to pursue, literally the, the size in that space. So if you can only, if, if what stresses you out is being far from your goal of having the right local sugar concentration, you're probably a bacterium. If, what, if, if on the other hand, you're able to pursue a goal about the size of a human arm, you're probably a collection of cells making an arm. If your goal is, um, you know, a particular quality of the Earth's uh, financial markets and, and, you know, peace among men, you're probably a human that you can, con- you can even work towards, uh, you can represent a goal of that size, right? Maybe, maybe one that's not going to be done in your lifetime. I and mean, that's an amazing thing that humans can do. So, so, so I have a very uh, functional, generic view of intelligence. I, I don't think it matters what you're made of, how you got here, being evolved, design. I don't think any of that matters. What matters is, are you a system that uh, can pursue different types of different scales of goals? And how, how competently do you pursue them? Do you get caught in local manim- minima? Do you have um, any kind of uh, delayed gratification so you can go around boundaries to get where you need to be, that kind of stuff. So the reason that, the reason that I think it's important to do that is people, people often have these binary categories, which I think are completely false and, and really hold back progress. People will say things like, I, and maybe some apes, and maybe my dog, and maybe an octopus, and people fight about that, uh, we are true intelligences. This other stuff, well, that's just physics. That's just a metaphor. I mean, I can see the mechanisms, you know, the aplysia has this and that mechanism for, you know, uh, um, habituation, and that's just chemistry and physics. I have real intelligence. This is, of course, uh, impossible now that we, we know about evolution and, and developmental biology. We know that each of us took a very smooth journey from being a pile of chemical reactions in an oocyte, in an unfertilized oocyte, all the way up to being a human that's going to make claims about second order cognition and your true intelligence or whatever else you've got. Every step along the way was nice and smooth. It was very slow. There was never a lightning bolt that said, boom, today you're, you're a cognitive being. Yesterday you were, a, you were, a, you were just physics. Much like in, in evolution, that never happened. You can, all, you can also start to roll back and ask yourself, whatever it is that you think you have, you know, moral cu- culpability and whatever, well, how about your ancestors of 200,000 years ago? Did they have it? Well, how about 4,000, 100,000 years ago, right? Well, how about, like, there's never a set of parents that were just, you know, sort of whatever, and then their offspring, bang, the offspring is now cognitive, right? That never happened. So we have to, we have, to have this gradual view of, of, of intelligence, and we have to be able to recognize intelligence in unconventional embodiments. We're terrible at that. We're, we're only good, because all our sense organs point outward, we're only good at recognizing intelligence in medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space then we're good we can see you know the the monkeys hiding the you know the thing of water and ah, that's that's pretty smart and so okay but but 
if you had access to your blood, like, like if you had in, in, if you had conscious awareness of the, the blood chemistry of, of your body at any given point, and you knew what your, what your liver was doing at any point in time, you would be able to recognize that, that organ as being very intelligent in physiological space. You would just be able to, that would be natural to you if we had senses like that, which we don't. So, um, so, so, so I'm always interested in, in problem solving and intelligence in weird, unfamiliar spaces. So now let's get to the, to the Zenobot business. Um, much like, uh, let's just warm up for a second with, the, with, this, with this example. Um, imagine uh, newts. Newts have uh, these, these little kidney tubules that lead, that lead to their kidneys. They are normally made from eight to 10 cells in a, if you take a cross section through the, through the tubule, eight to 10 cells make this circle and inside there's a lumen and that's your tubule, right? What you can do is you can, you can make polyploid newts that have more and more ends, you know, four n, six n, eight n. And as you do that, the cell size gets bigger and bigger. So the first thing that's already amazing is, wait a minute, with, 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 with extra copies of all the genetic material and you still make a normal newt, that's wild, but okay, that's one thing that the, that the, the you know, uh, the, the software can make up for like additional copies of every, of every piece of information. That's amazing. Gets better than that. Uh, the newts are the same size. So that means that fewer and fewer cells have to be used to make the same tubule because the cells are bigger. Right. So if you have something that's made of, you know, 10 Legos and the Legos are now bigger, you have to use fewer of them to get the same thing. So that's kind of amazing. We're now this isn't just response to injury or response to environment. Your own parts are changing and you can make up for that. That's amazing. The most amazing part is that if you make the cells truly gigantic, such that only one cell fits, what happens is one cell wraps around itself, leaving a lumen in the middle. And you get your you get your your normal sized lumen with a completely different molecular mechanism. So instead of cell to cell communication that builds a normal tubule, now you have some sort of I don't know cytoskeletal bending that that drags a single cell around in a loop like that. So what that tells you is incredible problem solving on the part of this collective intelligence. Despite the changes in your very own parts, you can call up different molecular components to serve the same large scale anatomical need. It's a nice example of top down causation, actually, because it's the it's the anatomy that drives the molecular biology in this case. So um, so that's just an example of 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 cells. You know, it's kind of like uh, I, I often in my in my own head, I call, I call it play the hand you're dealt, like whatever you've got, you're going to figure out some way of making the best of it. Right. It's, it's an amazing capacity. So we wanted to ask a simple question. Uh, about cells in terms of their plasticity and in terms of their um, ability to handle novelty. And we said this, uh, ima imagine this, uh, you look at an embryo and you look at the skin and you say, what do these skin cells naturally want to do? What do they naturally do? And you might say, well, they naturally want to be this two dimensional layer on the outside of the animal and keep out the bacteria. It's pretty boring, but that's probably what they naturally want to do. Well, that's not what they naturally want to do because if you take those cells out of that context, and leave them on their own in a little pile, uh, liberate them from the instructive interactions with the, from the rest of the, of the cells, then you get to find out what they actually want to do when nobody's bullying them into being the skin layer. When you, what they actually want to do is, well, they could have done many things. They could have crawled apart from each other. They could have died as some cells do when they're alone. They could have um, made a flat monolayer like a cell culture. Instead, what they do is they come together they form this little this little ball, and this, by the way, was all was all joint work with um, uh, Josh Bongard's lab. Uh, they form this little ball. Uh, the little the the cilia, these 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 moving hairs that they have on their surface, that you, normally they're used to spread the um, the mucus down the the body of the frog. They use those cells to row the, the the cilia. They use them to row against the water, and that thing starts moving around on its own. So what what can they do? They can do mazes. They can um, they can navigate all kinds of all kinds of shapes. They can uh, regenerate damage. Uh, they can the, the most amazing thing they can do is um, if you if you if you sprinkle a bunch of loose cells in their environment, they will go around and they will collect those cells into little piles like like bulldozers. They'll sort of bulldoze them into little piles. Guess what those piles do? Those piles become the next generation of xenobots. They start zipping around doing the exact same thing and on and on it goes. That's kinematic self replication, right? Um, it's kind of von Neumann's dream of a machine that, uh, that builds itself out of loose parts that it finds in the environment. So the amazing, so, so again, so, so here's what I think is amazing about it. And there's all kinds of practical applications of this that we can talk about, but, but more interesting than that 
I think, is this. There's never been selection to be a good Xenobot. Where does the Xenobot body plan and behavior come from? Because normally when you look at a creature and you ask, why is it a certain shape, a certain color? Why does it have behaviors? It's easy. You say, oh, a selection because it had a certain environment and everything that didn't fit that environment is dead. So that's why it has it. There's never been the Xenobots. There's never been selection to be a good Xenobot. Why do these cells know how to do this? Where does that come from? So it's, it's uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that we've pushed is this idea that this is a new robotics and engineering platform. Not only does it tell us something interesting about the problem solving of these cells, like, okay, now you're in a different environment, you're missing all the other cells that you're supposed to have, you can't reproduce in the normal froggy fashion, how are you going to do it, they figured out a new way to do it. Um, so there's all that plasticity, basal cognition is all that, but it's also a new way of bioengineering. Because unlike normal engineering, where you're working with passive materials, where you have to micromanage everything, you have wood and, 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 and copper and whatever else, you have to make sure that, that whatever you want to happen is going to happen. This isn't like that. This is a, an agential material. The, the cells have agendas. They know how to do things and they want to do things. And the only way you're going to get this material to do something different is by providing appropriate inputs, stimuli, rewards and punishments, incentives, uh, you know, attractors, uh, attraction molecules, whatever you're going to give them. You're not micromanaging it. You're, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it's like building a tower out of, out of uh, cats instead of bricks. It's a completely different strategy, right? Instead of, instead of putting them where you want, that doesn't work with cats. You have to do rewards and punishments so that you can, you know, sort of train them to do these circus tricks. So uh, that's, you know, we, we, we create the, the first generation of Xenobots by manipulating the signals, the environment that, that the cells get. They do the exact same thing to the next generation. The only reason this, this reproduction works is because they're dealing with an agential material. Right. This wouldn't work with passive cells. Nothing would happen. It works because the cells they're working with already all, all want to do this, too. And I think the other powerful thing about this is I think evolution does exactly the same thing. I think evolution is, 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 is mainly works by providing because 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 the material that evolution works with is 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 already an agential material. It's not starting from scratch every single time. So so what evolution does is it searches the space of the signals, the rewards, the whatever you have to give these cells to get them to do certain things. Like, hey, you're going to be in a, a two-dimensional layer on the outside of the of the tadpole. So I think I think it's in it, it the, these these um, these xenobots. Aside from all the practical stuff, they provide a new window on on problem solving, on origin of body plants, on evolution, on uh, on engineering, on the idea that you know evolution maybe doesn't build solution, doesn't discover solutions to specific problems. Like here's a frog to a, yeah, the, the, what does the frog genome actually know? Well, it knows how to survive as a frog, but apparently it also knows how to be a Xenobot. Who, who knows what else it can do? So, right. So, so evolution makes problem solving machines. It doesn't find specific solutions. And that is interesting because it doesn't sit really well with this traditional picture of evolution as blind and short-sighted. The idea is you know, normally, right? Evolution is supposed to always take the short-term payoff and it's supposed to be blind and whatever works now, that's what it takes. If that's were true, if, if that were true, why do we have these things that are so good at solving scenarios that never came up before? It's almost, you know, it, it, I mean, engineers do this because they have foresight, right? Because you try to make an, a, 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 you know, an autonomous vehicle or a robot or something that's gonna handle multiple things in the future. Evolution is not really supposed to do that. So I think there are many, you know, many deep questions here. No, for sure. Like I, I yeah, I feel like we could talk all night about this. So it's like fascinating stuff. And so like, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I had some questions about the intelligence, which you mentioned uh, prior to this, but I guess we can stay with the Cenobots for now. And like, yeah, I mean, I guess in theory, then could you do the same thing with human skin cells and all different um, potential uh, yeah, tissue cells? And then um what are the kind of potential applications i guess in therapeutics but beyond that as well with using this new way of thinking yeah yeah we're we're, we're I, you know i can't give any details because it's not peer reviewed yet and everything but but uh, i can we, we're definitely doing it with other cell types it's not anything to do with with amphibians it's not anything to do with being an embryo it's a much more it's a much more generic much more generic phenomenon um the applications uh, come in a couple of different flavors one set of applications is useful synthetic living machines 
So once we get better control and, and people, people have already said, well, why aren't you, you know, engineering them and you can put synthetic biology circuits in them and all Of course we can, and we're going to, but the first three, and there's a couple more coming, the first few papers about this are all native because, because I don't want to this to be, well, well, look, okay, put some kind of circuit in it and now it does X, Y, Z. And the point, the point is, look at what these cells already know how to do with a wild type genome, right? That's, that's the point. And but but then of course after that you program them. So once you start, once you can you, once you can program them with various mm, s- s- signals and stimuli and 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 maybe we put in some 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 circuits and whatnot, bioelectrics of course. Um, then you can imagine useful machines. You could imagine them. Uh, you, you know they're cleaning up uh, the you know oceans. They're um, uh, searching for for rare maybe toxic molecules. They're doing sensing, rescue, exploration. Uh, micro sculpting organs for transplantation, you know, hydroponics, you can imagine a million different, a million different applications, then you can imagine applications in the body, right? So, so cleaning up arthritic knee joints, chasing down cancer cells or bacteria in the, in the gut, uh, you know, fusing retinas back to, you know, where they belong, all that kind of stuff D- down, you know, someday, someday in the future. But I think that that's only the first level. The second level is, can we use these bots as a discovery platform to learn the rules of morphogenesis you see one of the things we're not very good at in fact we're really bad at is understanding the scaling of goals so when you make a collective intelligence system be it swarm robotics or a group of cells or some kind of social or financial structure whatever it is what is the collective going to want what are the goals of a collective they're not linear functions of the goals of the pieces that's for sure and so we're not very good at predicting those. We're not very good at recognizing them. We're not very good at predicting them. And we're not no good at controlling them. So can we use the Xenobots and that, those kind of platforms as an agential material in which we can practice this new science of understanding the scaling of goals? And then, and if you can do that, then, for example, in biomedicine, you could, if you, if you could, if we get good at telling the Xenobot cells what to do, in terms of make a you know make a you know make a little make make a shape that looks like a little house or something right just just generic control over growth and form then we'll be able to do that in vivo for birth defects traumatic injury um, aging degenerative disease cancer and having nothing to do with the bots themselves we'll be able to control what other cells build that that I think is is kind of the next level of applications and and then of course the third level which is sort of you know the most the most kind of philosophical of all is 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 to use them as a platform to really dissolve a lot of our um you know a lot a lot of our binary categories that don't really exist but but we always thought they did because of of kind of failure of technology and imagination we thought that there was a difference between machine and organism right people say that every every year somebody publishes a paper saying living things are not machines and 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 and, you know and so they have these binary categories that are that just they just set up a bunch of pseudo problems that uh, are not compatible with the modern uh, capabilities of, of biology.